Harry Nielsen wrote that one is the loneliest number that you ever knew. He goes on to say that two could be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. It's also the only number since number one, because that's how numbers work. But for me, two is the more lonely number. One at a board game day anyway. Now obviously no board game group leaves out one person from all the games. There's always a game available that will include everyone, but if I was left out on my own, I'd just come home. There's plenty to do here. But two plays for me is awkward. When your game finishes, you usually have to wait for another game to finish if you want to join other people, but then you start another two play game and then you're playing that when another game starts and the cycle repeats forever. I tend to avoid them is what I'm trying to say, but there are some good ones. I'm Rob from JesterTheRoad.com and these are my top 10 games for two players. We're all board gamers here, we love rules, so let's have some rules for this video. These are the games I prefer to play when the player count is two player only, even if the game plays more than two players. We're also assuming time is no issue. All players know the rules inside and out, and everybody brings their own stuff for the two games on that list where that's a requirement. So why don't you and I play a two player game right now? It's called hit the subscribe button. You go first. Number 10. Now I like sports and I like to play sports themes board games, but that kind of theme puts a lot of people off, so I tend not to buy them. So I like games that trick people into playing a sports game, not in a, a bad way, just like how Flam Rouge is like a Lance Armstrong simulator without the incessant cheating. In Warhammer Underworlds, players bring a team of minis, two decks of cards and half an arena and players will earn glory over three rounds by killing opponents minis and completing objectives. You need a small squad, around three minis, you need a deck of power cards to give you special actions and upgrades and you need a deck of objective cards to give you goals to achieve for glory. The mechanisms involve fairly standard movement with dice rolls for attacking and defending and a bit of tactical movement and area control for game objectives. The available races play very differently. The two customizable decks allow you to tune up the band to your liking and bringing your own half of the board makes it so you can be as closed or as wide open depending on your strategy. There is a semi-collectible aspect with new races released that come with cards that you can use in your existing decks so it does get quite expensive. But it is a really good tactical game and the customization makes it fun to tinker with and replay the existing factions. So all you have to do is find the perfect clan, build the perfect decks for your playstyle, play perfectly, roll even better, and you'll win. Piece of cake. Or strudel. Number 9. In Grand Austria Hotel, players entice VIP guests to stay at their hotel by fulfilling their orders at the street cafe. This is done via dice drafting. D6s are rolled and placed on the six different action spaces. On your turn, you pick one of those action spaces, take the power of it depending on how many dice are on that space, and then take one of those dice away. These actions let you get cake, strudel, coffee and wine cubes, hire staff that give you one-off or passive abilities, prepare a room in the hotel, or move up on some tracks. Fulfill the order of one of the guests and they'll stay in one of your prepared rooms and giving you a bonus when they do. There is other stuff like gaining the favour of the Emperor each round by moving up a track or face losing points and occupying multiple adjacent rooms in a hotel for a big bonus. But I know what you're saying, you're saying Rob this is a 2 to 4 player game, it doesn't belong on a 2 player game list you loser. Well firstly, ow, harsh. Secondly the dice are snake drafted so player 1 takes an action, player 2 will take 2 actions, then player 1 will take their second action. So in a four player game, if you're the first player, you have to wait for everyone else to take two actions before you take your second one. And for the math whizzes out there, you probably worked out that is six turns and they're not always quick. So if you're going first and eighth, that is quite a long wait. Also, it's currently ranked 69 on BoardGameGeek. Nice. Number eight. Back to the two player only games. And this one claims to do World War II in 20 minutes. In Blitzkrieg, players play on either side of World War II, playing units into different theaters of war in an attempt to win them. Players pull tokens out of a bag and place them on different values on the tracks to try and get them to the end tug of war style. Alternatively, just be furthest ahead on that track when all the spaces to place tokens on that track are full. The tokens themselves have different strengths and abilities and can only be placed on land and sea spaces where it makes sense. The spaces you play on also have abilities which include drawing tiles, putting your opponent's tiles back in their bag, moving up on other tracks and straight up scoring points. It's very fun and really quick playing. All you do is you place a token, resolve the space, move up on the track and draw another token. So the game zips along nicely. Also, one of the expansions adds Godzilla. So there's that. Back in reality, there are also tokens like spies and nukes and stuff. You know, the elementary stuff. Number seven. Now about a year ago, I did my top 10 worker placement games. And sadly, I forgot this is a two player only worker placement game. In Homes, Sherlock and Mycroft, players are laying down meeples on the Homes themed worker placement spots to gain investigation markers, swap investigation markers for cards and other more tricky actions. Players are three workers and they're used in a pretty cool way. 
In round one, there are five spaces available. Players can't go in the same space themselves, but both players can go in the same space. If they do, that space is flipped face down for the next round and can't be used by any player for that round. Then meeples are stood up on their spaces. New worker places of spaces are added and now players will move their stood up meeple to a different spot, laying it down, obeying the one meeple per spot per player rule. After seven rounds, you'll have a bunch of cards to score. For each set, the player with the most scores one point for each card they have more than the other player, plus three if they have the full set. I really like how the game works and how the order of cards coming out really changes how the game plays. It's really worth a try. Okay, from a public domain IP on Earth to a very protected IP in space. Number six. In Star Wars Rebellion, one player plays as the rebels hiding in the rebel base on a planet in the system. The other player is the Empire trying to find and destroy it. Players play cards with leader standees on them to activate them and to build units and move around and you know the kind of stuff you would expect. As the Empire, you can probe planets to look for the rebel base, you can even destroy them with a Death Star. In one game, I even got to capture Luke Skywalker and turn him over to the dark side. I lost the game in the end, but that was a battle I very much enjoyed winning. I skimmed over assigning leaders to cards, but it's actually quite tactical. You can recruit more and assign them all to a ton of cards and play them all, but you need to hold some back to move and attempt to counter your opponent's cards. To move, you pull units in towards your leader, assuming they can move. Things like walking units and TIE fighters need to be on either cruisers or battleships or whatever they're called to be able to move planet to planet. I of course meant Star Destroyers. From the Empire point of view it's like one big game of Battleship where you only need one hit but you're obviously you're managing all of the other stuff that makes the game worth playing. I'm not a Star Wars fan at all but games like this and Outer Rim I really wish I was. Can you imagine games like that in an IP I would really like? That would be magic. Number five. One of the rules for this list is that the players know the game inside and out, and this game is the reason for that. I've gone 20 plus years without teaching it from scratch, and I'm not starting now. In Magic the Gathering, players each bring a deck of cards to cast spells and creatures to whittle each other's life down from 20 to 0 to win the game. Now this is by far my most played game of all time. We go to pubs, we go to people's houses, we go to sanctioned tournaments, and we play Magic for hours. Decks contain 60 cards and contain lands that are played and used to create mana. Mana can be spent on spells that can do a whole number of things. Players can also play creatures which they attack with and the other player can block with their own creatures. There are over 50,000 magic cards available at the moment and an ever expanding rule book so I'm sure I'm quite out of date. I haven't played for quite some time. Purely down to the tournament scene becoming very repetitive and boring and the other thing was, what was it? Oh yeah, buying 4 copies of one decent card cost as much as buying 5 decent board games. Well, that was 2013 prices, it's probably only three decent board games now. This was the hardest game to rank on the list. I love it, but I haven't played it for some time. It's good with two, but it's also really good with five, so I just put it in the middle. One advantage of magic is at least I could spell it. Number four. I don't think you can have a two-player game list being completely free of abstract games. In Mind Leaf, which has a silent J, you're trying to make lines of at least three pieces of your colour. But don't skip just yet, there's an interesting way to play pieces. The piece you play determines where your opponent can play. Straights with a plus and diagonals with a cross mean they have to play in any empty space in a straight line up and down or across diagonally from the piece you played. Pushers mean they can't play next to the piece you played and pullers mean they have to play next to it. If your opponent can't play they have to pass which means you can chain a few pieces in a row which is really satisfying and also high scoring. When a player is out of pieces you score, you get one point for every line of three pieces including diagonals, plus one for each piece after the initial three. This is because the board is made up of four different squares and you can arrange them any way you like, not just in one big square. It's really fun, quick to teach and very tactical. Ok it's been four inches since we visited a world war, let's get back to 1942. Number three. In Undaunted, players take on the role of one side of a war using cards to move tokens on a map to shoot, complete objects and try and win the war. This entry will be spoiler free. And we'll look at Undaunted Stalingrad which is the Russians versus the Germans in a 15 game campaign. Players use deck building to move their units on the map. Scouts move into unscouted areas and can scout them. Riflemen can be used to control scouted areas and gunners attack and suppress opponent's unit. Units can attack by rolling a number of dice depending on the strength of the attacking unit and rolling higher than the value of the defender's defense value plus any bonus they have for being in cover and distance away on one of those dice. Squad leaders and platoon sergeants allow you to buy new cards to add to your deck. Squad leaders can only create units for their own squad. There's a branching story and a load of really cool stuff I can't get into because of spoilers, uh, but even the core gameplay itself is really good fun. I can't really say much more than that. If I break your trust with spoilers, I don't think I'll be able to patch it up. Number two. In patchwork, players will be adding patches to a quilt to cover as much as possible. Players have buttons and use the buttons to buy one of the next three tiles in the selection, then they add it to their quilt board. They then move up the number of spaces on a time track as shown on the taken tile. 
And it's one of those games where whoever's furthest back on the time track gets to take their turn next, so you could have a few turns in a row. The first player to pass those one space squares gets it, and when they pass a button space, they gain a button for each button icon showing on the patches on their quilt. And when both players get to the middle of the track the game ends, they get one point per button they have, and minus two point for every empty space on their quilt. There's a really good app version of this, and I've played it quite a bit. I did spend a lot of time with the app trying to map it out, see if I could work out that we can always pick the very best tile on your turn, and I came to this exciting conclusion. I, I don't know math. And now, number one. Finishing up on the abstract train. In Camisado, players have eight pieces called Dragon Towers of eight colours at the ends of an eight by eight grid made up of those colours. Pieces move forward only as many empty spaces as you like in a straight line or diagonal, and the start player can move any piece. And that's where it gets interesting. The next player then moves the colour piece that matches the colour of the space the previous player ended their turn on. So if you end your turn on a green space, they have to move their green piece. You, you knew that, I just wanted to make it clear. The goal is to get a piece to the back line of your opponent's side, called the home row. This means every attacking move is also a defensive one, because you know what piece they're going to move, you want to make sure that you're not going to let them move a piece that goes straight onto your home row and scores them one point. The piece that made it there gets a dragon tooth clip, which limits its movement distance to 5 spaces, allows it to push a tower when moving, and scores 3 points when that piece scores. A piece with 3 teeth can push 3 pieces, and scores 15 points when it scores, but can only move 1 space. This is very fun, very tactical, very quick, and very easy to teach. You can get a tiny pocket version you can play standing up, you can also get a max version that has a 10x10 10 10 grid with additional pieces and gameplay rules on the back of the board. So there's a bit of something for everyone. That's my list, what are your favourite games to play with two players, let me know in the comments. And in case you were wondering, Jaipur was my number 11 and I haven't played Targi. Thanks for watching, remember to like, share and subscribe, you can follow me on Insta, Twitch and YouTube at Just the Rogue or find the blog at JustTheRogue.com. I'll be Rob aka Just the Rogue, I'll see you soon.